I just to give you a warm welcome from Auburn University. I know that some of you decided to travel for a long time to come here, so all of you, welcome. How the course will work will work that you are very welcome to raise your hand, ask questions all along the presentation. Okay, but before going to the technical detail, I have to give you some practical details about the course. First of all, who I am. My name is Andrea Cattoni. I work here as a postdoc researcher. I got my PhD in Italy from Genoa in 2008, Master of Science in Telecommunication Engineering in 2004, and since 2008 I am postdoctoral post researcher here in the Radio Access Technology Group at Auburn University, and I am external consultant in the Nokia Siemens networks. Musician since all my life, basically, and as you can see, doing also not really normal things. <laughs> but why? When a researcher is normal, never. So, I have to thank a number of entities uh, for helping me uh, organizing this course. First thing, I would like to thank Trinity College Dublin and the CTVR, uh, because I will have a lecturer here, which is Luis da Silva. He's not here now, but he will join later on and the Q project, which is uh, one of our main testbed projects in, uh, in EU. Uh, besides to that, the Samurai project that will provide the demo. Please, <coughs> come in. That will provide the demo uh, uh, on Friday of our testbed, Asgard. And the cost actions, ICZ0902 on cognitive radio and ICZ0905 on techno, economical, and regulatory frameworks for cognitive aid. So, once given these uh, credits, I would like to, to tell you which is the goal of this course. The goal of this course is, as I said, to provide an overview on the cognitive radio technology and on the main topics and issues that run around cognitive radio. If you are here to see specific algorithms or specific uh, developments, it's probably not the right course. Because since not all of you work on cognitive radio, because at Auburn University we try to provide the broadest audience possible these courses, it's more at a more higher level. Technical, but a bit, you know, world view. And in practice, today we will see an overview on cognitive radio technology, and some insights on the topics. And then we would like to give you some uh, algorithmic framework with Luis da Silva, some theoretical framework with Petar Poposki, who is uh, another lecturer here at Olbo University, and some ideas on the softwares for developing cognitive radio in test pets. So the first part of this course will be an introduction, a general introduction to cognitive radio. So, let's start with what we mean with introduction. The concept first, a really, really general overview on the main research fields and topics. A bit of history, starting from Mitola, Aikin, and all the, a couple of visions on the cognitive radio con concept on how it was supposed to be, and some application scenarios. So, first of all, what is cognitive radio? A lot of people try to give a definition of it. These are something that I selected. ITU, FCC, other uh, regulatory and industrial forums. So radio system that senses, is aware, dynamically and autonomously adjusts, uh, can change transmitter parameters, uh, interact with the environment. More or less, all of them have something in common. What is this something? I should have animated it, sorry. Uh, in general, they talk about a radio. Pretty obvious. And then they talk about interaction with the environment. 
This seems, you know, something trivial to say, but it's not. Because today's radio, most of the time, do not interact with the environment. So, and then we talk about measuring. This means that they have the environment, and first of all, they measure something from it. Even in this case, it's not always true. And then we talk about decision making. This is one of the most important processes of cognitive radio. Without making a decision, we do not have the cognitivity. This is the one of the main enablers. And then, once we have decision making, they, add, but they need to do all of it autonomously, independently. They need to do things on their own. We don't need to have someone tweaking the parameters, tweaking the knots, just to make it work. They need to do everything automatically. And this means adaptation. They need to evolve and adapt to any condition in that they face. So we have sense, making decision, and just, and an environment. That is the main principle of cognitive radio. Whatever else, more deep, is just a specification of this concept. So, <clears throat> What can we do with this? Without knowing anything, just starting from those definitions that we got, we almost get to what it is called today the cognitive cycle. If you look at the slide, oh no. Can I go to previews, please? Yes. If you look, there is sense, make decision, adjust, environment, and sensing again. This is a cycle. And this is exactly what the cognitive cycle is supposed to do. Repeatedly, it repeats itself infinitely, because that's the only way for adaptation. And of course, once we have all this initial information, do we already know how to develop a cognitive radio? Of course not. That's out of, out of question. That's not enough. That just defines the main framework, the main structure, the main principle. Even if we have a more, little bit more detailed cognitive cycle, we don't know what to do. We are still missing information. These definitions that I showed you are definitions on paper. They are regulatory. They need to be open. They do not need to provide technical indications on how to uh, implement a cognitive rate. In literature, there are more detailed definitions, and that, uh, these are um, definitions that we will analyze somehow, and we will look to a couple of them. And before going into this specific definition, let's have a bit of history on why cognitive radio was born, because Without knowing the history, we are lost in a pitfall. So, the beginning was the software defined radio. What is software defined radio? It's basically something where we have an RF processing, we digitalize the signal, and then we have a modem and the network stack which is everything software controlled or software implemented. Let's call a software modem or a software controller that tweaks the parameters of the radio. Why was it attractive and was so a big fuzz years ago about the software defined radio? Because once you have some hardware resources that you cannot avoid, because you cannot generate a radio, purely software radio with no hardware, it's impossible. You need some hardware resources. And then on top of these radio other resources, you can mount on top of it whatever standard you want. Whatever network protocol stack you want. You see, yeah, okay, that's already done in the mobile phones today. Why was it so important? It was because, you know, 
years ago, let's say 20, because sort of the fire radio was out about, about 20 years ago, and 10 years ago was born. 1995. 25, so okay, thanks for the, <laughs> the correction. So, I'd say a lot of years ago, so, um, the, to put multiple modems inside one terminal only was not that easy. Just remember that 20 and 25 years ago, the first GSM phones were barely available and were costing a hell of a money. And it was just GSM, nothing mounted on top. Now, of course, we had, since the Moore's law, the size of the chips shrink it down, we are able to put 3G, GSM, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS. Do you, do you have something else? You can put it, no, no problem. But at that time, no way, no way. If you would have told someone 20 years ago, I want a phone with these characteristics that we have today, forget about 3G, which was not even available, but the, first, the last four, yes, it would have come out to you with a rack. Just to implement the phone. You, you know, 25 years ago, there was the very, very comfortable handheld mobile phone, which was basically a suitcase just for transmitting. So having this cheap development on software only was really, really, really big boom, was really attractive. And it was really a revolutionary concept. <coughs> so why they would have liked to have this multiple stuff? Because first of all, you has 20 years ago had CDMA 2000, and there was GSM in Europe. These were the two big booms. US still has CDMA, CDMA 2000 some net, some of the networks. Correct me if I'm wrong, Louis. So you are the, the, the American guy. Uh, and besides to that, even GSM was in different bands. So having multiple modems with a basic hardware resource able to do at least these two standards was already something very useful and instead we ended up having with quad band mobile phones with basically one baseband processing but very very separate filters and now have receivers so it was not optimized and the other very very big boom was given by the fact that they needed emergency management and public service interoperability again this is the typical you know earthquake scenario where everything is disrupted and you need to communicate with interforces, I don't know, firemen and military and whatever. And they have, of course, different uh, standards. And still today in US, I had a discussion with a friend, they have in each county, city and force, they have different standards. Even in the same city, police and firemen, they have two different standards. Why? It's useless. But still they are having it. Even if they have, instead of adjusting at, at, you know, at the bureaucratic level this thing, you have a device that manages these things for you, it's way, way easier. And military, of course. It's the, it's the, the typical uh, application. I have a network connection problem. Let's see if it works here. So, now we know why software-defined radio was useful. And once we have this concept of doing things in software, there was some guy named Joseph Mittler that one day decided, OK, I am developing XML for radio systems, so I can easily configure these radio systems just with an XML file, easy to write, easy to code. Why don't we take something, which is still software, that manages these, you know, uh, XML files and meta languages auto autonomously. Artificial intelligence was and still is big fuzz in the computer science world. So this new radio concept was basically invented, as I said, funny enough, it was not even a radio guy that invented the cognitive radio concept. It was mostly a computer science guy. But while developing software for radio, decided, okay, but why don't we make radio smart? And so was the cognitive, cognitive radio concept was born. 
Here in the slide you have the reference to the very first paper that appeared, uh, which is cognitive radio making software radios more personal, uh, from uh, Joseph Mitola, and it's dated from 1999. First appearance, and in 2000, Joseph Mitola discussed his PhD dissertation on this topic at uh, KTH. That's it's here in Sweden. So, moving forward, a big, you know, uh, little of uh, bibliographic references. These are five of the main books that I could suggest you. The most uh, famous one is Cognitive Radio Technology by Bruce Fette, which has been referenced and cited billions of times because it contains a very nice overview on all the different topics of Cognitive Radio. Uh, there are something more related, for example, to XML. This is from Joseph Mitola. Uh, or more, a bit more oriented on physical layer or cognitive networks, uh, or otherwise, this is what, one of the latest one, where uh, Alexander Wiglinski uh, is one of the editors, and it's very very nice. It's a big big book, but it contains a kind of deep overview on uh, on which are the topics uh, that one on cognitive radio. So once we have a bit of this, you know, reference, basic ground. Let's go into why we need cognitive radio today. Because you could say, ah, okay, it's nice, it's funny, it's, you know, you could simply take it as an academic exercise, but why do we need cognitive radio or something that goes into the direction of cognitive radio? That's because today, still today, we have what we call the full convergence. We have a number of devices, more and more devices, I would say. Um, which are these ones. We have in your mobile phones or in your, our tablets. We have MP3 players or multimedia players. We have photo cameras and we want cameras which are more and more, you know, high quality because why bother in bringing a big camera when we have the mobile phone? And we have gaming systems and we have, you know, the laptop uh, in the office uh, applications. And as you can see here, there is a new vision of the Ubuntu guys that would like to make Ubuntu on mobile phones for having your office everywhere. And then we have the cloud. The cloud is basically everything. Everything you can imagine, any application doesn't run on your device, it runs in the cloud. And why this is a problem? This is a problem because the cloud no matter what you do in the cloud, it requires a massive amount of data transmission that needs to be ensured with proper QoS to and from your mobile device. Today, we are struggling with the current technologies, with the normal, what we call the normal technology, and we need to go to something else. The current standards are moving in these directions, and I will show you later on why? But this is basically the, the reason why we need cognitive radio. The cron another reason, once we have the applications that are pushing us to have more and more complex and sophisticated and intelligent devices, we have another little problem. And the problem is that if you look at your left side here, this is the radio allocation table for US. That's a very, very famous picture in the current radio world. As you can see, how much free space do you see in this picture? Anyone has a very, very precise, you know, pinpointing eye that could tell me exactly where? <laughs> no, you can't. 
you can't. It's almost impossible. Everyone is trying to do it, the same exercise since 10 years, and no one managed so far. They need to reshuffle or refarm and move systems here and there, because this one are the licenses that have been issued by FCC, which is the Federal Communication Commission of the US, for using the spectrum. You want to use it, we allocate for a certain type of system, that's the license occupied. Plus, this one, 2012 to 2016, this is the Cisco traffic increase forecast. Now you see, as you can see, this is 2012, this is 2016. In four years, you, you have how many times? Eight, 10. In 2020, this traffic increase is supposed, compared to today, to increase the amount of traffic of a thousand times. You sum this problem with this traffic, boom. What do you have? You have a total disruption of the telecommunication systems. You cannot have broadband communication, basically. Why? Because the new systems require higher bandwidth, require higher data rates. How do we deal with it? That's a big problem. That's called the spectrum crunch in the, in the business and telecommunication uh, terminology. <clears throat> so, let's see if this guy works. <coughs> now, let's see what the Federal Communication Commission, the same guy that was issuing licenses, foresee in terms of broadband data. It foresees that here, you know, this is the traffic data go from 2009 to 2014, and as you can see, it's 1,250% of the traffic in only five years. And this is the amount of spectrum that it would be, you know, surplus. Once we serve the, all the traffic, how much spectrum we have left? 2012, we still have 87 megahertz. Nothing. Next year, we will miss 90 megahertz for serving this amount of traffic. 2014, which is two years ahead, we are missing 275 megahertz of spectrum. How do we deal with it? Because it's, this is a huge problem. Because we, there will still be customers willing to pay for the services, especially now that every one of us wants to be connected. I suppose that, let's say, let's raise your hand. How many of you, also you guys in India, are paying for a mobile phone subscription with data in? Okay, not, not impressive, I would expect it more, but <laughs> very in India, how many? Do you have mobile phones with data? Yes. Yeah, okay. It's more or less the same amount. So if you guys are willing to pay, plus just imagine the guys with the iPhone, that's a big boom. I mean, it's not that all the spectrum is really occupied. We have a big bunch, but really, really big. We are talking about 7 gigahertz of spectrum available at 60 gigahertz of carrier frequency. There's only one problem, that 60 gigahertz is not exactly the best spectrum for coverage. Because at that frequency, how much do you expect to cover? Any radio frequency guy here who can tell me? A couple of meters. Uh, let's say that we can do a bit more, but five meters, yeah. mm, five. And how much would you like? Let, let, let's go really, really housey. Which is the coverage that you would like to have in your flat with your Wi-Fi, for example? 20 meter radius. Yeah. 20 meter radius, okay. Do we deal with 60 gigahertz, 20 meter? No. Nah. Okay. So, I mean, someone is trying to do it, but the su commercial success 
even if you do it, you know, even if it's feasible, I don't know, it's practical from a commercial point. So here you have a couple of uh, references. Uh, the same term crunch and spectrum crunch has a very nice definition on the Federal Communication Commission website, in their own Wikipedia. So let's say, now we know that we have a problem. But, there is a but. There were some measurement results that were done, and they are still done today, but the big boom happened in 2002, when the Federal Communication Commission uh, issued their own uh, report on spectrum utilization. So, okay, now we have some spectrum allocated to someone, but how much it is really used? As you can see from the chart, from these 30 megahertz to 2.9 gigahertz, we have that the maximum utilization of the spectrum is 25%. And the New York, which is, I suppose, a big town, I've never been there, but uh, I suppose that there will be a lot of people calling and making, you know, data traffic and whatever. The, max, the city average utilization is 13% in frequency and time. We are talking these two big domains. Okay, there is this uh, report uh, where this uh, chart has been extracted and I have to thank uh, Hussein Hauslan uh, because this information comes from, uh, from him, from his tutorial at WCNC 2012. So, <coughs> we can say that the spectrum is allocated statically from a regulatory point of view to someone, but this someone is not using it. Now, if we do something smart, we can exploit this under usage of spectrum and making feasible the traffic increase and tolerate it. <coughs> so, from here comes the definition of spectrum holes. So as I said, 2002 was the big year. This, uh, you know, under usage of the spectrum was clearly measured by FCC and there was this report issued. And they defined very nicely that there are points in frequency, time and space, where the spectrum is temporarily not occupied by any transmission. We call this opportunity a spectrum hole. And their own usage is called opportunistic usage of the spectrum, because we exploit the opportunity. And then it came also the definition of what is a primary user or primary transmission, means someone who has the license, has paid for it or has received the license from the government and has the full right to use it. And the secondary system that is exploit this opportunity and that needs to do it without interfering with the primary user or system. So now, 2002. In 1999, came out cognitive radio. Ten years passed. We should be ready. We should be using this technology now. No. First of all, because there are technology limitations. I know that there are some guys from the technology platform section here, and they can probably confirm the fact that having systems where we have an extremely wide RF bandwidth, let's say from 30 megahertz to, don't go too much, but 10 gigahertz. And we want all of it to be sensed and exploited in a snapshot, has, first of all, RF, uh, hardware problems and has most of it digitalization problem because you don't have analog to digital converters 
that can exploit that type of bandwidth. You have just stepped into my PhD. <laughs> so, so far I know that there are commercially available analog to digital conver converters which are able to do something like 20 giga sample per second. But each sample needs to be quantized. Let's say that if we want to, ah, we are satisfied with 8 bits. 8 bits, each sample, 20 giga sample per second, multiply, it's 160 giga, 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 giga bit per second in a bus. Welcome. Not possible. And besides the this, technology is the main problem. So if we cannot give a product, no chance. And the second thing is the regulatory process and the regulatory requirements. Changing a regulation takes a hell of a time. And even if you have a technology ready to work today, the day that will come to the light in the market for usage after changing the regulation, it can take 10 years. So we have a problem. 10 years passed. Let's hope that the regulatory process is out almost finished. No, not really. So <coughs> besides from 2000 and uh, from 2000, let's say from 2000, once we have this cognitive radio concept that was released by Joseph Mittala, and the spectrum problem that was finally say, okay, we have a possible solution, we have opened a Pandora's vase, because cognitive radio, the, same, the name cognitive radio means everything and nothing. More in the specific means that we need to do spectrum sensing, we need to do spectrum management, we need to do radio source management, we need to do air interface definition, because what do you want to use? Do you want to use the the GSFK, GS, <coughs> sorry, the, um, the, Gauss, the Gaussian modulation, no, we need something more smart, we need probably UFDM, but maybe no UFDMA, more, or something non orthogonal even. So we need still to define a lot of things. And we need to define also hardware and software. There are billions of groups and thousands of papers that deal with it now, in this moment, in the world. including us. So let's try to set a bit of, of vocabulary, which is the basic that we will need in this course. So spectrum sensing. With spectrum sensing, we means algorithms and techniques for understanding what is in the air. That's what I, I mean. We can start arguing if this is a, you know official definition or not. I would like to give you what I think about it, OK, <laughs> so far. Spectrum management. Spectrum management means making active decisions on how to optimally use the available spectrum. This is called spectrum management. Radio source management is making active decisions on how to optimally use the available local resources okay, for guaranteeing the best user application or user or application experience. That's what I usually mean with these three terms. Plus, we have air interface definition. With air interface definition, I mean exactly as I said, the development of what's going in the air. So let's say OFDM, OFDMA, or even going beyond it, because we need to improve spectral efficiency. Otherwise, we cannot deal with that thousand traffic increase. How do development? We discussed about it. Now we know that we need hardware support for having a proper radio. And software development, because <clears throat> you know, we will discuss about it more in detail. But we need software radio platform, and means that we need software for enabling real life cognitive radio experimentation. It is about time that we do not only talk about it, but we show it that we can do it. So, how cognitive radio should be then? We briefly talk about it, but this is the so-called cognitive cycle. 
you can see it in different shapes and uh, specific definition we see the two of from Mikola in 2000, and in 2000 or the Hikins one from 2005 that was another big paper that was basically cited by everyone <laughs> at that time uh, but the main characteristics is that we have sensing part where we understand the when we take the environment in we analyze it in order to understand what's going on we make a decision on how to optimize our own parameters and we take an action because we need to carry on the action in order to be responsive to the environment at the center of it there is lower learning the key enabler of the real of the true cognitivity is having a system that it is able to learn from its own mistakes from its own past and reason about it why there was a mistake and do not do the same mistake again in the future that's the true cognitivity do we have it now no <laughs> That enables a lot of researchers to have their salary paid. Mitola's cognitive radio, which are the main characteristics. Multi standard, that was his goal. We need to have multiple standards in the same device that is able to you know, connect to the best opportunity. Here we were talking about, for example, GSM and CDMA 2000. Uh, is, that, is that, in that case, more kind of a software radio? Exactly. Because uh, actually that concept that he introduced, it's more related to, to kind of uh, uh, software radio. So basically you just try to operate in a different kind of uh, technologies. So yes. uh, there is no any cognitivity there. Not really. That was the basic starting point. Because if you look at Mitla's paper, there is something extremely specific, which is terminal-centric. He was talking always about a PDA, and it is user-oriented. So the cognitivity is mostly not in the radio itself. It's mostly in how the terminal deals with the user needs. As you can, there will be. A, I will show you the funny uh, representation of what it is in the paper. But uh, he thinks mostly about detecting the environment with multiple sensors like you know voice and video processing and so on i remember one of his speeches at software defined radio conference in orlando 2006 he was actually showing a video of someone mounting a video camera on the on the glasses in order to to have the radio being able to detect what the user was to, was trying to do and show him how to process the video uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, the idea was to use the radio to enhance the user experience. But the radio is just one of the tools, not the only one. The other tools are mostly software, how to optimize the calendar, or how to optimize the, prof the sound profile, the ringtone profile of the, of the terminal. And that's what what is his cognitive cycle. So, as you can see, if you look carefully, there is basically nothing related specifically to the radio. That's more an artificial intelligence uh, diagram. Because he was a software guy. So he was not caring too much about you know, the specific detail of the radio channel. He was caring about user experience from a software point of view. This is an artificial intelligence state diagram, basically. Eikin's vision is a bit more poetic. He goes really down into what the radio is supposed to do. Uh, for time reason, because I want to show you also something more interesting uh, for today, I will skip some slides like this one and we'll just talk about it in these terms. That's the Simon Eikin's cognitive cycle. As you can see, he talks about the radio environment. He talks about the RF stimuli, radio scene analysis, spectrum walls, noise flow statistics. And that's what Simon Eikin sees in his vision. He talks about 
you know, interference analysis, channel state information, uh, adaptive signal transmission, power control, MIMO, turbo processing, that's the video gun. That's the vision I followed basically all along my PhD because that was a radio, it was not only a general artificial intelligence. Going into scenarios, something practical, that's the Mitoa scenario I was trying to tell you about. So we have some guy that, you know, I added these arrives in a kind of airport, and according to the country, the radio, okay, we have this country, over the air, I download the proper software, and I reconfigure to be able to connect. And then the guy jumps on the taxi and gives the address, and speech, recon speech recognition detects destination address, computes all these type routes and maps and so on, and it starts informing, you know, all the cells all along the path of the taxi that there will be an endover and in order to optimize the connection until the destination address. That was Mito's vision. That was a real smart terminal that it was sensing the entire world. Uh, I remember one paper, I read one paper once, but unfortunately I don't remember which one, where there was someone suggesting that the terminal that was called something like John uh, was dropped somehow on the floor and uh, it recognized by the sound where he was and he started calling the other, uh, you know, uh, phone, fixed phones of the guy where, where the, the phone was so the guy could pick it up. So, 2000, that was the cognitive radio we had at the time. <coughs> but today, a very, very hot topic, and some one of you probably knows about it, it's the wireless regional area network on TV white space. White space is the specific name it has been given to these type of spectrum holes. So, and that's because, first of all, let's talk about US. In US, the TV channels over the air are not so overused as in Europe. So there is a bit more space already because cable is, has just bigger diffusion. Uh, and the problem that they had is that there are rural areas where it's not that it's impossible to provide internet to the rural areas, it's that from an operator point of view, it's extremely costly. And the revenue for it is not that high. So it, you'd have no break even, basically. <coughs> so what they decided to do is said, okay, we have this opportunity. TV, the TV channels have an extremely good coverage. And they are not used because either, you know, they were allocated 20 years ago, but now there is the cable. And or there are some local or regional broadcasters that do not use the channel all the time because, you know, those small TV, small TV stations where they have, I don't know, six, eight, 12 hours of transmission a day. So I said, okay, now, now let's do it and let's try to transmit. This picture has been taken from a European project because also here in Europe, we are sensitive to this type of technology. A project called Cosmos. And they have several types of usage of TV white spaces. This is the most, let me say, famous, but someone is also thinking about extremely low power communication TV white space in indoor. And, you know, in the beginning, the main intention was, wow, we have spectrum sensing, we are smart, we detect the holes with the spectrum sensing, and we decide to transmit. But unfortunately, someone at the, you know, FCC decided to tell them that probably was not, not the case. And we'll discuss about it. And then, <coughs> there was in, uh, in Hyperpoly a big push in a certain moment because they said, okay, now we have a solution, Deve let's develop a standard. And the V standard was the 802.22, which was the first cognitive wireless radio area network standard. Wow, it sounds fantastic. Since they needed to do something pretty quick, because they felt that there was a huge need, 
what they did, they took what they had from the 802 standards, and in specific the 11 and the 16. So they borrowed concept from WiMAX and Wi-Fi, and they made this, uh, this new standard, where this is, for example, this is a very nice paper about the standard on the uh, IEEE Communication Magazine, where they compare the, the different standards in terms of data rate and in terms of um, <coughs> spectrum and capabilities and so on. And if you look here, for example, in this table where you define the air interface, it's really, really similar uh, to WiMAX. Uh, with the only, you know, um, difference that you, you have a special frame that allows uh, dynamic spectrum sharing, which was substantially contention-based. Uh, because this frame, again, you, there is no comparison in the paper, but let me tell you that this is basically a very, very similar to a WiMAX frame. Uh, there are some uh, parts of the frame which are muted uh, where they allow the newcomers or the neighboring networks to exchange beacons and so on in order to see who are the neighbors and to allow newcomers to enter the network. <coughs> and everything is very simple because it's based on a on a scheduling map which is transmitted right after the preamble uh, for the following frame. That's very, very simple technology. The modern scenarios are that, as I said, FCC was not that happy about the spectrum sensing base because it was not guaranteeing enough tolerance for interference free transmission of the primary users, which was the TV broadcasting. So they said, okay, now we set also the database on the side, and then at a certain moment in 2010, I think it was November or December, they said no more spectrum sensing required. So if you want to have spectrum sensing, you are very, very welcome to implement it and to have it, but you don't need it. If you want to access the spectrum, you need to have a database access. This means that before having the broadband data transmission, you need to contact a database centralized and the database tells you if you can use or not a certain frequency because it's occupied or not. It's extremely dynamic. It has really, it's really, really fast. It has a dynamicity of one week. Because the, the database is refreshed by the broadcasters every week, and the same does the, the, the terminal. Every week you say, OK, may I use this one next, next week? Yes, no. Uh, there is, you know, starting from this one, so far, there is also, you know, I don't know if I, I put a figure or not, but uh, there is already a product. It's, it's, it's in a trial made by um, FCC and a company called Spectrum Bridge. Uh, there is also Google in this play, there is Microsoft. Big companies are trying to, they got a temporary license as a database operators because they think that there is a market where these middleware of, of, of database operators need to be paid for providing this service to the user. Uh, but there is an extension which is called the authorized shared access where they took this uh, database concept and they extended it to a more dynamic way and a bit more distributed, not centralized by the FCC or the central, regul central national regulators. That's the, what I was trying to tell you. That's the, the very, very first trial that started in January, if I'm not wrong, 2012, where Spectrum Bridge providing the database, and this is the KTS wireless providing this roof-mounted device. Extremely mobile, as you can see. Uh, <clears throat> and you really need to connect it to your antenna and so on. I, I don't know, because I didn't investigate too much, how it is supposed to connect to the database. I don't know if there is a GSM module inside or if there is any other specific you know, control channel. I need, I need to investigate it. But it needs a mean to contact the database because it's supposed to have no 
uh, ADSL connection or no fixed connection. Uh, Microsoft and Google, as I said, are, are, in, the, are in the game, uh, of course. Um, I mean, this is more or less how, how it works. This is the Google proposal uh, on the architecture of the database. And uh, that was taken from the Spectrum Bridge we website. And the database is supposed to have an, app and an API for FCC. API is Application Programming Interface uh, for the FCC, a public interface, and an inter-database interface. Another interesting thing is that <coughs> if you go on the Spectrum Bridge uh, website, I don't know if I put the link, uh, you can check online which TV channels are available at current moment in a specific region of the US you, you pick up from the, from the database, just like Google Maps and tells you which channels are available. It's really, really nice. But I was saying, you know, the inter-database interfaces because they are supposed to have more than one operator and these Operators need to synchronize their own database in order not to assign the same channel or uh, to have one channel that for one database operator is marked as occupied and the other one is free. And this creates a lot of, you know, very, very interesting issues for the information theorists for security and privacy issues. Uh, the database is, a, is an interesting theoretical thing. But not my field, unfortunately. Uh, there is a generalization of this concept, uh, which is uh, based on uh, uh, authorized shared access. That's, I have to say, there is a, it, it very, very you know, particular, because authorized shared access is not a technology. And that's what everyone I talk to remarks. Authorized shared access is a regulatory framework. There are a number of companies now pushing it, and I could mention, if I remember correctly, uh, Huawei, Nokia Siemens Networks, Nokia, Qualcomm. They agreed that they need it because they would like to use some other bands for LTE, for example. And they are trying to push into the regulations this concept, and the concept is that probably better described here where you have the administration regulation uh, that has a number, you know, a certain, let's call it database. There are the number of, you know, regularly allocated uh, spectrum uh, licenses, primary users, let's call them. And then there is what we, we call the as a license. I mean, that I need to go to my regulator, I need to ask for a license, if the regulator tells me, yes, you are granted an as a license, then you need to go to the owner of the spectrum, stipulate a contract with him, and once you have the contract, then you are allowed to use that particular license spectrum. While FCC said, okay, I give you the license, and the usage of the spectrum is free because it's a... Uh, it's considered an unlicensed bed, an unlicensed secondary opportunity. In this case, it is licensed, and that's because it, it's basically they are trying to put a framework on the spectrum leasing concept. So you can lease spectrum. That, for example, is from the from the military. They have satellite services, or companies that have um, civil satellite services. And this framework would allow both the primary and the secondary to have QoS, something that in the previous TV white space vision was not foreseen. This ASA allows everyone to have guaranteed service. That's really, really important, especially if you talk to mobile operators. Because you don't want, for example, to go in someone else's spectrum and then you are kicked away in a second and the users are kicked out in a second, and the users become unhappy, and the users change the mobile operator, and the mobile operator is not very happy at all. Uh, in the beginning, the smartness was supposed to be in the UE. That's where Mitola located 
all, if not, I mean, if not all, most of the smallness. <clears throat> but along the here, we decided, okay, let's move <coughs> this intelligence to the network. It's easy. Now it's not only in the network. It's supposed to be, I mean, the new vision is that the intelligence is in the cloud. And the cloud is everywhere and nowhere, basically. Because every device connected to the network is a cloud, is part of the cloud. And already today we have some examples of smart systems where a certain amount of intelligence is put into the technology. And I, will, I would like to give you an example uh, taking into account a technology that I started knowing very well uh, in the last years, which is LTE and LTE Advance. So, I took here the same slide set that I showed to you um, about about Ikin's vision. And the same stuff. On this side, I put LT advanced features. So we have spectral analysis, channel availability, and interference analysis. We have multi network sensing, carrier sensing, RSRP, which is received power, uh, received. received Reference signal received power. power. Thanks. Uh, also from other cells and from other networks. We have CSI uh, CQI, also with compression, channel quality estimation. Uh, available capacity analysis and rate feedback. Adaptive modulation and coding, link adaptation. Dynamic spectrum allocation. We have autonomous system for selecting multiple component carriers in LTE and for dynamically doing it. We have developing the technology, if you talk to these two guys, is what we are doing uh, every day. Uh, traffic analysis, we have QoS and scheduling and without mentioning everything which is in the core network. Uh, adaptive signal transmission and reception. Power control. We have fractional power control, for example, and we have DTX and DRX, which are the, the features that controls the, um, the efficiency pattern in the device, for example, in order to have energy efficiency and go to sleep when not needed. FDM, here we are talking of FDMA and single carrier FDMA in uplink. We are talking about MIMO, several MIMO modalities, including coordinated multipoint transmission, meaning that I can do MIMO from different cells or turbo processing, turbo encoding and turbo decoding. So, of course, in Aikin's paper, there was more. As you said, there is the interference temperature, there is game theory, there is a number of theoretical methodology. But if you look at the practical aspects, what do you think about this comparison? As you can see, of course, I have, I have to admit it. I, I didn't cheat, but I put here only the most relevant things that I wanted to point out. But as you can see, there is a good mapping. So we can claim somehow that cognitive um, LTE advance can be seen as a cognitive system. It's a bit, you know, emphasizing it, but we are not too far. Every day we are introducing a huge number of features that go in that direction. If you think that the hot, one of the hottest topic today in LT Advance is what we call the self-organizing network, which is a centralized methodology for optimizing the network. It, I, I, I can call it artificial intelligence, but we are going in that direction. We need to uh, we need algorithms to optimize autonomously the network at a very, very you know, low time granularity. 
because traffic is increasing, the traffic dynamics are going crazy, and we need a network which is always optimized because otherwise we've got spectrum lacking and if we are not 100% efficient with the resources we have, we can't manage. Just, just, I would maybe repeat the question of a colleague that as far as I know in LTE, it's the base station, the E node B, as it is called, decide which subcarriers or which research blocks more yeah. are being used by users. Yeah. So it's more, again, centralized. Then, because what I would understand, pure cognitive radio, the users itself decide which research blocks belong to whom. But again, it's something like somewhere in between. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and cognitive radio in itself, I will point out later on in this course, is not a product yet because we are lacking a univoke vision. You can tell me that um, cognitive radio is a fully distributed system. And so we are going into a dock. I can tell you that cognitive radio is a cellular-like system. Who's right, who's wrong? Mm. None of us is right, none of us is wrong, because cognitive radio is an abstract concept. Mm. To make it practical, we need compromises. And that's the current compromise that we have. And if I have to be honest, I would never believe a system where the user of the mobile terminal decide everything on its own because one of the main principle is that in that way the terminal is lacking information unless you allow control channel signaling in a massive amount of data to exchange information to know the topology of the network and so on you will always end up in a completely suboptimal and sometimes highly suboptimal way and if you see of the problem of the spectrum, and we do technology for the users for being applied somehow to a certain amount, certain kind of market. I mean, there's no chance that a fully distributed technology where you need 10 gigabyte per second of information just to decide one subcarrier can be applied into a market. There's no chance. No chance at all. So that was what I was telling you about <coughs> self-organizing network. I, I, you can read on it on the slide set. And for you guys in India, the slide set will be available on the internet. So don't worry, we will give you, we provide you the material. But as you can see, there are a number already of available features. Plus, now we are going into what we call heterogeneous networks. I don't remember if I have the, the slide scene or not, but we will have multiple technologies, multiple networks, multiple layers. Everything is multiple. Everything, the problem is it's multiplied billions of times. And these guys here are trying to make distributed versus centralized solutions for handling this complexity. It's not easy at all. But it's something that we need, and we need it today, because the, if you go and talk to the operators, the operators say, I want SON. There are companies selling SON, big and small. Uh, for example, uh, one of our uh, colleagues, uh, an extremely important one, I would say, which is Andrea Goldschmidt, she just moved from academia into being a CEO of a company called Accelera, and they are developing SON, because that's what is the intelligence now and because the operators need it they are desperate for having autonomous systems just to provide you some you know reflections so far we have the idea of having a system evolution from LT we move to LT advance because we needed more and from LTE we move it here. And LTE again was another evolution from the uh, UTRAN, EUTRAN, from UMTS basically. 802.11 we started with the very first draft years ago and then we moved to the B version, then to the A and then to the G and then now there is the N and tomorrow there will be the AC. 
where we have dynamic bandwidth aggregation, dynamic channel selection, and QoS. Or we have another opportunity. We can say all of it goes into the trash bin. The old technology, we don't need it anymore. We need a revolution. We need to start from scratch, design from scratch, new interface, new protocol stack, new systems, new features, new ideas. Which one is the right one? I don't know. I have to be honest, I don't know. What I know is that today we need to work on both of them. We need to make the decision if we want a revolution or an evolution at the latest point in time. Lean development, agile development. We need to go there and if and only if we see that we cannot squeeze any more from the evolution, we have the revolution ready. Otherwise we will have a gap of 10 years between one system and another. Or Cloud Run, it's, it's coming. And it's coming already in LTE. If you look at latest products from vendors, for example, Nokia Siemens Networks, but I, I, know, I know them very well because I work with them. They have a new product which is uh, doing this type of thing, which is called baseband pooling. So you take the RF from a motor radio head, you feed down via uh, fiber into the central system, the, the digital samples in IF, and then you process the bandwidth in one place only. Why we, we can do, why we would like to do it? Because it's cheaper. Because we can do that processing on lower cost commercial louder instead of having to implement everything in a base station and the base station need to be small uh, and then there will be temperature requirement and so on. You simply take the RF, which is the thing we know how to do it, and when you stream it down, you put it into a server room if you want, voila, you have the product. This is the first step. Those people say we need to do, have everything in the cloud. And stream samples and data everywhere in the network, and the world is the network. Forget about the concept where the room is the network or the building is the network. Now the world is the network. We need to stream data everywhere in the world to have it processed and serve the users. Do I believe in it? Not really. Latency problems. But somehow part of it, we can do it and we will do it. So, with this one, I conclude my first slot of lectures. <laughs>